What's up, traders? Anthony Cardelli here, and thank you for tuning in to the Features Radio Show. We are live here today with my guest, Merritt Black. If you're watching us on Twitter, on Periscope, give us a, wee, a retweet or a like uh, to get more people in here. And if you're listening on YouTube, click the subscribe button and give us the thumbs up if you're enjoying the podcast. Boy, I'm excited to talk with Merritt today. We always have great conversations, Merritt and I. Today, we're going to talk about how He's funding traders with $50,000 to trade futures. We're going to talk about that process, what a trader has to prove to merit to get funded with 50 k We're going to talk about NADRO. If you listen to my podcast in the past before with Merit, we've talked about NADRO quite a bit. Uh, very interesting. I think you're really going to enjoy that. Then we're going to go to the charts and we're going to talk about ES, maybe a little bit of CL. Crude's really moving today, so we'll see what Merit thinks about that. Futures Radio Show is sponsored by CME Group and Micro Treasury Futures are coming to CME on August 16th. To learn more, go to activetrader.cmegroup.com. Futures Radio Show is also sponsored by Trading Technologies, that's TT, Trade Station, and FTSE Russell. The Russell 2000 is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 future symbol RTY and Micro E-mini Russell 2000 future symbol M2K. To learn more about FTSE Russell and their products, please visit footsierussell.com. Back in 15 seconds with Merit. Get S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100 by the slice. Just one-tenth of the pie. Trade the tastiest index futures, micro e-mini options with TradeStation. Get a piece of the pie now. Merit Black in the house. No mustache, no beard, everybody. Clean. He's clean, clean today. He's really cleaned up, man. <laughs> Uh, so I want to get right into it today about what you guys are doing with Apteros. First off, tell us what Apteros is. It's a, it's a prop firm and education company. Um, on, on one hand, it's, it's providing training, providing resources, education, mentorship, community for not just for anybody, but for people who are interested in going down a certain direction of a methodology, which we refer to as NADRO. You don't have to trade just like me, just like I teach NADRO, the same timeframes. You don't have to trade the same products, but you have to be of that mind in terms of some of the frameworks you use. And now instead of getting into a chat room with uh, you know 600 random people talking about Elliott Wave and, and everything else right hey rsi is above 80 here okay buddy i i don't care you know <laughs> hey i'm getting a five wave count or however you say it okay man i don't care i don't know what that is you know whatever so it's like-minded people talking the same language saying here's not only i would say secondarily importance like here's things i'm seeing in the market in terms of our community the biggest part of our community is going through this arduous journey and path that is becoming a consistently profitable trader and the journals and the outpouring and the heartfelt camaraderie and all this stuff as people are trying to figure this out and figure themselves out on the way to doing that. So anyways, long winded there, we've got education, in the community for the sole reason of getting people to the desk. The desk is the, the pinnacle of, of, of what we're doing. And there it's all about showing what you've got. I, we have a particular HR process that I like. We're not another one of these like firms. I don't know what to call them that are just quote unquote prop desks, quote unquote backing traders. Um, we're really looking to do that and are doing that in a big way, looking to grow traders, develop them, really be on a small team. Uh, th that's the difference. If you're out there looking at like different funded programs or whatever, do you want to be a number? Do you want to have probably better splits and, and, and different things? Or do you want to like, have rates like you have a membership seat? Do you want to have true accountability and, and sitting down with me and, and talking about your monthly goals and, and what you did last month and having meetings uh, you know at 11 a.m. with your peers on the desk and, and talking about what you did that day, what you're seeing? It's, it's a real prop desk in a, a remote environment. So for anyone in the world. Yeah, and you come from a prop background, obviously, with SMB for a lot of years. You were one of the yep. guys, if not the guy, who started the futures prop desk there. The guy, like, yep. Yeah, the guy. So you know what it takes to 
get traders to the point of becoming professional. And I look back at my career and I think if I didn't have the pit and I didn't have the community that like you're creating now, uh, I would say prop is a great way to go because you're gr guiding them to to become a professional. You're, you're bringing them up to certain levels that they wouldn't be able to get to on their own, at least right away. I mean, I think it's taking the time way down. So 50K is what you say you're going to fund these traders with. Mm -hmm. What is the process that you – so take me through it. I go to your site. I want to become – uh, one of these prop traders to get uh, you know, get the 50K. Mm -hmm. What do I have to prove to you to be able to get that done? Yep. And let's keep in mind that 50K is it's just a starting point, okay? That's, that's yeah. just – I came from a culture at SMB where it's, you know, whoever you've – if you've read Bella's books, it's 100 shares, right? Or less, right? Because they can trade, you know, fractional amounts. I guess everyone can with Robinhood these days. But start small. We want, I don't expect you to be a superstar when you come on the desk. We start small. So 50K is small, guys. That's not like the opportunity in an in a end, end of all opportunity, right? We want to grow you from there. So to answer your question, um, you simply need to show us over a, a minimum period of trading days, you have to put up quite simply, without a bunch of rules, without a bunch of things to, to trip you up, without any type of trailing drawdowns or whatever, that you can make 10K before losing 4K. Okay. And you could take four years to do that if you want. Obviously, there's a monthly fee that's involved. It costs us to run this program. So it's simply show us that you can put up decent, not extraordinary, decent risk adjusted returns that you can manage your risk that you cannot violate daily limits and whatnot okay that, you, that you're responsible essentially because guess what what's one of one of my main concerns is as someone who's backing you are you going to be responsible with your risk are you going to be an adult about that and, and be a professional if not hopefully you don't make it through the system that's 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 how we feel about it so and, and why do this? I do not believe if I sat down with you, Anthony, or or anyone that I could tell from talking to you. I, I might have my hunches as to whether you could be a good trader as I'm assessing essentially your mentality, your psychology, how you talk about things in life and maybe activities you do and, and things like that. I can't tell if, you, if you've got what it takes or not, but I, I can tell you what does tell me if you put up risk adjusted returns in, in a a paper trading environment as a start, you've at least got some of the factors there. So that's so that's the, it. So the number one thing that you're talking about is just pure risk management. You didn't talk technicals. You didn't talk fundamentals. You didn't talk about strategy. You didn't talk about anything. I don't care you how said, you do it. You you could tell me that it's moon phases. I don't care. If it's risk adjusted performance, then I like what you're doing. From there, do you look at the trader and say, okay, you achieve this. What are you trading? What markets are you trading? How active are you trading? I mean, like, there's then I'll it's like let me through. get to know you. Yeah. So, so for someone who passes the tryout, a lot of people think that I'm sitting here all day monitoring everyone that's in the tryout. I'm not. I don't care really what I don't care what you're doing. Until I until I start to see someone who's really doing well, then I start to pay attention to what they're doing. Um, and so then it's like, hey, Anthony, you you passed. Let's sit down and talk. Let's let's hop on a Zoom call. Let's figure out. Allow me to get to know you. Products, timeframes, where your edge comes from, um, everything that you're doing. I want to understand your process, your methodology, and why is that important? Well, I'm going to be one of the main ones, and eventually your peers as well on the desk. But I'm going to be one of the main ones that's looking over your shoulder that's holding you accountable, that can come and tap you on the shoulder and say, take a break. You're done for the day. Um, we need to, this that's showing up in your statistics is a major problem. Let's address how we can make it better in the coming week, in the coming month. I need to understand you before I can really start to add the most value to your trading. If you're just 
some random person trading that I don't know anything about, then I'm not going to be able to be as helpful to you. So it's a big deal. Yeah. And what I think is so interesting about this for, for all the traders out there listening is that the first thing that you're just really asking them to prove is like you said, risk, can you make 10 K before you lose 4 K? You don't care how long it takes. So time doesn't matter either. Right. It's just right. right. And I think that's important because everybody's in a big hurry to get to the 10 K. Right. As that's a, right. Cause they got the 300 bucks a month ticking against them or whatever. Well, guess what guys, that's just that most tiny fractional amount of skin in the game. So you do need to feel that a little bit. And it's amazing what people who have a lot of money who really genuinely could care less about the $300. It matters to them. It bugs them when they violate a rule, you know, which is just the daily loss limit or whatever. And they have to pay a hundred bucks to reset or whatever. Like it bugs people, which is good because it should bug you when you start trading live as well. So it's, it's a good uh, formula. Well, I look at myself. I started off with twenty five thousand dollars. After six months, I had nothing. <laughs> okay, would I if I was yeah. just trading in a sim at the end of that six months? And you said it was three hundred dollars a month. I would have had a majority of my money. And I think True. this is the biggest issue that I I believe new traders coming into this industry have is they is time, is expectations. They come in and they have expectations to make money right away. I mean, we all do, right? I mean, I, I'm not saying that. You know, that's it's just coming in and expect to lose. I mean, you, you kind of have to have that attitude, but you, you want to that, still have that mindset to win. But go ahead. You you have to come into trading. And I, I remind people of this after having told them beforehand all the time. You have to come into trading and say, I'm going to be a, of, of the student mentality. That, I think, is key. A student mentality doesn't right. have lofty expectations on a day-to-day -day basis of performance. If you have that at er, in the early stages, it's only going to get in your way. It's only going to start to make you think you have psychology problems before you even have a remote semblance of edge in markets. It's only going to make you learn slower. I've said when and asked quite a bit lately, I don't know why this question keeps coming up, is what advice would I give to new traders? And I continue to say to them is think long-term and your short-term results will take care of themselves. I think that this is kind of ties into what you are doing. If, if you have somebody new coming into your program and you were to give them one piece of advice about getting funded, what, what would you say to them? one piece of advice. I mean, that's, that's tough without knowing anything about them. I mean, yeah, let's it, say the general thing, the reason I, I just want to kind of piggyback off that, because I'm trying to like build how I think they grow into not just a funded trader, but this is more about your experience, seeing how the prop side works and how a trader grows into becoming a, a successful trader. I don't yeah. think every trader listening to this is going to go into the Aptero uh, uh, program. Uh, but I think that the process that you're putting in place is extremely important because it, it shows them how to get to the point that they want to get to. I mean, so you can't that's mess around with risk and you can't expect it to happen tomorrow. So it certainly sets that that framework. And then it's, you know, honestly, one of my biggest pieces of advice that I always give to people trying to to get good at trading is to journal. I, I think it's huge, not only just from a psychology perspective, and, and start to figure out where you go off kilter and where you start to like do some bad things and whatnot, which generally can be helpful at identifying those patterns, but just jotting down in, Hey, this happened on this little pattern here for at 10 15 this morning in the S and P let me write down. I thought that was interesting, right? Just a gen, a, a, a market observation. Cause you can have a lot of those thoughts throughout the day and kind of forget about them at times. So, Take a screenshot, you know, make a little notation to go back and study it. Journaling throughout the day is one of the things, because think about it. The arena of trading, where does it occur? Is it on the computer screens in front of you? Is it out on the exchange? Is it somewhere in fiber optic wires? Where does the, the battle of the, the arena, where is it? It's right here. Absolutely. You may, like, ultimately a signal may run down my arm and to the mouse and I might click something or I might hit a hot key on my keyboard, but that's from it. This is where tra trading occurs. Okay. So 
let's take football, for example. They have a big game on Sunday or whatever. They go on Monday and they watch film, right? Okay, let's look at how we did this play at this time. You know what? Hey, tight end, you were supposed to roll it, roll out and block here, you know, whatever. Quarterback, you're supposed to read this coverage. Look how you didn't see they were in zone versus man or, or whatever. I'm not a football expert. But reviewing film, they can go back and clearly in black and white see what decisions were made in what contextual situations. You don't have that in trading because everything is occurring in this arena. So if you just write some stuff down with timestamps, if you just journal in some way, whether it's you speaking into a recording, whether it's you recording yourself like this, whether it's you with a um, you know a, a notepad writing stuff down, whether it's typing it in, in um, Notion or whatever, document what happens in that arena of trading so that you have some game film to review. That's more than just where you click the buy or sell button because that's the end result of a lot that happened up here. So I'll shut up now, but that's my no, but biggest advice is to journal in some capacity. And that means that you need to have time. I mean, this is why you're setting these people up right out of the gates to say, look, it, I don't care how long it is, but just prove this one thing. And it's also a short-term goal and it's a focus goal. And it's not something that is creating some crazy strategy or finding, uh, you know, something that is absolutely going to work all the time. You're not even being talking about that. Just being a student. What's that next step then? Okay, I, I think that we understand that the initial part of our journey as traders and, and the journey to become a part of your program is, okay, take your time, journal, write things down. I wrote things down. I actually had one of those recorders because we didn't have iPhones back then. I had one of those uh, like uh, the dentist recorders or yeah. doctor recorders. Uh, I, I wish I had that audio. I don't know where that is. But um, and then pretty you, funny at times. <laughs> oh, man. There was a uh, there'd be a lot of curse words on that thing. So then what's that next phase? Because I think this is where I could see traders all of a sudden saying, I've done this. And, and then they get ahead of themselves. And all of a sudden, it's like, I want more. I know I'm just thinking the way I'm thinking because I know how I am. And once I do one thing good, that's I'm, very I'm natural. That's very natural. What people tend to get, they start to see a little bit of success or, or whatnot. And then all of a sudden, they're not that student anymore. They come in, they place performance expectations on themselves on a short term basis. And we're dealing with a random environment here, guys, and regardless of what your strategy is. Um, there are days where losing a little bit of money is is a great day for you. It's what you should do and, and you executed flawlessly. So the biggest mistake that people make at, at that phase where they start to put it together is, well, now, now I've got this thing figured out. So I demand this and I expect this on a short-term basis. And now performance goes out the window because you lose your objectivity totally. and you lose that. I'm going to say some very powerful words here. You lose your innocence. You lose the love of markets. You lose the purity that comes with being open-minded and being egoless as a student would. Submitting yourself to being open to what the market has to teach you and to what you can see objectively for your strategy and your tools. Those are some very, very powerful words, and it's a big deal to lose those things. So ultimately, the goal is to revert more towards that childlike state, that open, intuitive state where you're self-aware and all those things that make you a strong trader. To, to, and why, why any of that? So that you can go execute as well as possible. If you, if you get all that stuff out of whack and now all of a sudden it's about I want to make X dollars today or I want to um, have a certain win percent you know, or whatever and you, you focus on that thing on the next trade, which the outcome of is random, and the next trade, you're just totally screwing yourself. So that's the biggest path that I see people go to once they start to see some success. So then what is that next step? You bring them in. You've been through this. What do you sit them down and say, okay, here's what you focus on now? Identifying holes in process, identifying holes in a trading plan, whether it's 
on the trade management side, whether it's a little bit of a lack of selectivity on things, it's starting to look at the numbers, I think, and start to say, here's where it's typically not here's where you're you're not making money or or where you're necessarily losing money but not keeping money which is losing but there's typically a place where people are really hurting their bottom line and we can enhance their profitability by diving into the stats based on what they're trying to do and whatnot so we'll we'll look at a trader who hey you've had a good run here but quite frankly your edge is on a razor thin line here. We need to beef up, beef up your risk reward. Based on what I know about you and what you're trying to do, your risk reward in terms of, let's say, adverse excursion to favorable excursion data is not as good as it could be. Let's take a look at, at selectivity. Let's take a look at trade management. Let's take a look. Oh, turns out you're, you've got this thing where you start getting scared and you move your stop to break even really quickly. And these trades are really good ideas. Look at how they're they're working out a lot of times. Things like that, finding lack of process and holes in process and finding actionable next steps to where you're kind of bleeding out in some areas to really firm you up and, and, and make you more consistent. I love how focused that makes them because that I think in a lot of ways – can keep them from doing what we talked about and getting ahead of themselves because now you've got another focus. I mean, this is that's right. This is why traders at home without the community environment, without the pits that I had and all the, the mentors uh, that I had that some of them didn't even know they were mentors to me. You that's can awesome. get off track so easily because if you're not somebody, I, I'm very type A. So I was always, I was always focused on the next thing, right? Like what do I have to work on right now? And that helped me and hurt me in a lot of ways. And something that you talked about in that second step was, I think, focusing on some weaknesses. You said some holes, um, but I think also talking about some strengths. How yeah. do you go about that evaluation in terms of – this is a question I think is, is extremely important because I've had this little bit of a debate with people on Twitter about this. What is more important, to, to recognize your weaknesses, to help build your strategy, or to recognize what your strengths are? To, to build your strategy? What do you think? Is it both? Is it they're one? Stupid the question. They're, they're equally as important. Okay. Anyone who says, oh, you can only build from your strengths is an idiot. Anyone who says, oh, you only have to focus on correcting your weaknesses is an idiot. You, it, It's both. If you're going to make a little on a strength and lose, where's my camera, an equal amount on a weakness, which one of those is going to, you know, make you more profit? It's they're both. It's a net result of strengths and weaknesses. You need to stay balanced. So I think for a lot of the type A's, I think for a lot of traders, it's very easy. I fall into this camp to just focus on weaknesses. I want to be better. I'm hard on myself. Oh, My dad was one. a hard worker. I'm a hard worker. Oh, you know sorry. what I mean? Like that's that's like the more common mentality. So you have to, and Dr. Steenbarger was who really brought me personally to, to being more aware of, you need to stay more balanced in your approach of strengths and weaknesses. You want to build from those strengths. Don't forget about what you're doing well. Therefore, what I teach my students and, and my traders, and I'll get onto them about it. I'll say, hey, you didn't have this section in your review here on your daily report card or whatever. And that is, what did I do well today? Or they'll just give me a little lip service on like something that I can tell they just like kind of half-ass wrote like, yeah, I did this well. No, 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 no. What did you really do well today? And it could be something very simple, but really think about it. So routines and process on a day in and day out basis, including pre-market and post-market and or journaling can help people like myself who tend to focus on the negative to remind you, hey, let's let's also look at what we're, we're doing well. It's both though, Anthony. It's it's both. You got to do both. I totally agree with you. Each one of them taught me something different about what I needed to work on and what I needed to put more into my strategy. I look at my weaknesses was fading moves. So I needed a, a layer indicators that's, that, that told me to stop fading these moves. Yep. You know, I, I'm just by nature – 
if something's too high, which we think it's too high, right? As a trader, you sit there and go, I'm going to try to make a couple of ticks against the grain. And that would just be death by a thousand cuts by me. So I had to learn how to put something in there to say, don't do that. I had to put something to block it. And one of my strengths was I was, when something was working, I would press, but then I would get over aggressive. So what did I have to do? I had to put tools into place to say, okay, here's where you can be really aggressive. Here's where you really shouldn't be. And, yep. you know, I, both of them are things that, I think it comes down to, we've already talked about this self-awareness, but it's acceptance of them too. You know, I'm That's a competitor, a you're a competitor, right? I mean, you and I came down to the final hole last year. He got me by a stroke, everybody. I'm pissed to even admit it, but he did. He got me. <laughs> but uh, the as a competitor, it's hard to accept certain things that you don't feel that you're good at uh, or, or your, your weaknesses. And to me, when I've opened that up and said, look at Man, if you want to get better, if you want to be a true competitor, I mean, I look at like a guy like Tom Brady, he just, he just keeps, you know, he, he accepts that he, he can be coached. And I think that's really one of the things that makes him one of the greatest athletes of all time is not that he is the greatest athlete in terms of the, what he can do, which he's great at as well, but it's because he can be coached. He can allow someone to say, this is not working for you. And he just, I mean, I've watched some of those tapes on him. I don't know if you have, but the guy is, he just. He just does it, you know. He doesn't. He doesn't fight what he's not good at, and what he is good at, he he keeps close to him and uses. I mean, I, I want to talk a little bit more about that. I think that's also comes into what you are as a, as a coach in a sense. Are you coaching them throughout this, or how does that work? I certainly try to. Um, it's different. People need to hear different things, which I guess is what a good coach would do, right? You don't just have these standard things you tell everyone. You know, some people, for example, some Mahomes over Brady, that's uh <clears throat> we don't it's not, I I know. <laughs> Excuse me. I know. Sorry. I love Mahomes. Of course, but yeah. come on. Um <laughs> uh where was I? Um okay, so for example, in 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 telling someone something they might need to hear. Someone who is more like me might need to hear and kind of think in real time as they're placing a trade. This trade is probably going to be a loser. That could be a very helpful mentality for 50% of traders out there. That could be a train wreck thing to tell yourself for some other non uh, similarly psychology wired, psychologically wired uh, person out there that would instill fear in them. That would make them second guess the trade. That would make them not be able to pull the trigger, blah, blah, blah. But for someone like me thinking, hey, know it all, this trade's probably trash. Okay. Just like half your trades usually are, this one's probably one of the losers. Okay. So get that through your thick skull, right? That that's a healthy thing for me who can tend to get a little too caught up in the perfect analysis, the idea that's so great that all the time frames are lined up, everything's beautiful, uh, order flow looks perfect. Guess what? I'm still a mid 40% win percent guy. Most of my trades are wrong. So accept that, coming back to that acceptance term, that little affirmation for someone like me from a coaching perspective, whether it's self-coach or literally a coach telling you, is healthy for me because it gets me more towards the middle in terms of mentality of where I need to be in a healthy way. For for other people, um, boy, they need a, that extra boost of confidence. They need, hey, you've done the prep. You've stalked this trade. You've used your checklist literally, physically on a piece of paper in front of you. This All the criteria for you having a positive expectancy situation are present. You've done all the playbook trades. You know this inside and out. Pull the trigger. Be confident. Don't worry about the outcome. Be confident on this is what your job is to put risk on where your edge tells you to. So coaching to me is about telling people not what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. And, and having some tough conversations around what someone's nature is and, and some things they can do to think differently. Because I think at the end of the day, 
as traders, you have to think differently than probably everywhere else in society um, for the most part. That's so well said about coaching. And I was on a podcast the other day where Allison Raquel uh, interviewed me and she asked me what was the best piece of advice I received about trading. And I said, it wasn't the best piece of advice I received about trading. It was the best piece of advice that I needed to hear at the time, going back to what <laughs> you said. I remember coming home and telling my dad and going, dad, you know what? I don't know, man. I don't know if I can do this. I, I love this business, but I just I just can't make money. I don't know what, what the hell is the matter with me. Yeah. And he goes, buddy, look it. If you love it and you want to do it, he goes, figure it out. It was like, it's my, my dad said it to me many times in my life, right? But at the time, I needed to hear it. It's like, if you really want this, figure it out, right? And then I learned over time that it's not just about figuring it out one time. It's about constantly working to figure it out. And oh my that, goodness. That, yeah. Right. The, so that, that that's why you have to maintain that student mentality because exactly. you're going to have to refigure it out. And that's why one thing that you reminded me of earlier was when we were talking a little bit about uh, focusing on, on strengths and things you're doing well, document the heck out of those things. Because I can tell you the first couple of times I went through let's call them more severe drawdowns where I, I had it all together was a CPT and then felt like it all fell apart and I just couldn't do anything right. I didn't have any documentation on process on all the things that I was doing and it, it, very good. And I had nothing to go back to, to say, here's what you need to get back to. I was sitting there scratching my head. How was I making money? How was I doing this so well? And now I can't hit the broad side of a barn. It's document what you're doing well so that when things go awry and ultimately you get a little too cocky and you start deviating from what brung you to the party, you you have something tangible to go back to and say, ah, I got to get back to doing this fundamental well. That's a big deal. Oh, absolutely. And I'm loving this conversation, everybody, but we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to talk to you about how important technicals are in your program and you think just in trading, like what indicators or do indicators matter that much? Then I want to talk about Nadro because several people wrote in and said, talk about Nadro. Nadro. We'll quickly go to the charts and see what you think about ES and CL and everybody, we will be taking your questions live. So be sure to put them in the YouTube chat. And while we're gone, jo enjoy this quick clip that I took from myself with Jared Tendler last week. We'll be back in a minute fear and tilt because to me i use fear as my greatest motivator fear to me i use them as drivers like i said just purely as motivation talk to us about just what we all deal with is in with fears we got to look at emotion more holistically and say you need emotion to drive your decision making to drive you towards your goals i, I saw the jordan shirt behind you he was a master of being able to, to control his emotions. And for him, anger was his big motive. So we look at the best of the best. They have a mastery of their emotions to be able to find the right formula to produce the best outcomes for them. So for you to use fear in that way, I, I think it is common. Where I would question, not necessarily for you, but for uh, other traders, is that driver limiting you in some way? Is it uh, affecting your decision-making in some way? And if the answer is no, and it's only additive, giving you the right motivation, giving you the right kind of clarity and focus when you when it comes to execution, then it's not a problem. It's actually helping you. Trade the global markets with trading technologies. TT is the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Now with integrated tools for advanced options trading, cryptocurrencies, and trade surveillance. Learn more at tradingtechnologies.com. All right, buddy, we are back. So I want to start off with technicals. We didn't talk much about them at all. How much do you believe a technical strategy matters? Well, this touches on some conversations we've had in the past, but I think that it, it, it's for people who are technical based, which 99% of traders are these days, um, even on an institutional level, you think they're all like, information flow stuff. They're technical too. I've sat on those desks. Um, that's what your edge is, in my opinion. Now, I know there's all these conversations around like, my edge is my mentality. Like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I understand that you can't do it. But if you if you have the, 
the mentality and, and the strength of a warrior and the Dalai Lama and everything does, doesn't mean you're profitable trading. You won't be. Okay. <laughs> so you have to have a technical edge. Okay. That is trades with an asymmetric risk reward skew that you learn how to identify and you learn how to access and capitalize on and manage risk for and all the technical tools. And I don't care what you use. You could be Nadro based and we could know exactly what we're doing. You could use all kinds of other stuff that I've never even heard of. Technical tools are the foundation of, of 99% of traders edge. One of my favorite lines on this podcast was you kind of touched on it a little bit there is when we talked about statistical edge versus mental edge, you go have one of these guys go out and trade with the Dalai Lama for six months and come back and trade the S P 500. <laughs> yeah. On a one minute chart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I know it's, it, it be, I talk a lot about trading psychology. I talk a lot about mental edge, but you have to look at it in context, right? I've already developed my strategy and I think that I've done a mistake by not explaining that as well. And you just explained it perfectly that if you don't have that technical edge first until you develop that, it's how do you develop mental edge with execution? You don't even know what you're looking for. That's right. That's right. So it it's on a scale. Okay. So you start at, at, at zero where you have no edge. Well, let's see. How should I explain it? Let me just say it simply. At the beginning, it's all about figuring out your technical edge, while I think importantly, learning about the mental frameworks and ways of thinking probabilistically and whatnot are, are very important, but you've got to figure out that mental edge. It's, it's, I, I saw someone in the chat earlier said for me, it's like 80% of the game, right? I may, or I, I couldn't comment on if that's a good thing or a bad thing for that person, because it depends on where they are in the spectrum. If you're starting out, mental game is like zero or 1% and technical stuff is 99 or hundred percent. Once you start to figure some of that out, guess what? Now it's about coming in and being able to perform what you've learned to try to do. And now it's about getting out of your own way to be able to go do it. So the oh, further yes. you go along the, the spectrum, the, the, it's not the same. It's, you can't say, Hey, you day one trader, remember 80% of this is mental. That's not helpful to them. Okay. But you talk to the pro, you say, Hey, 99% of this men is mental. Okay. Exactly. You've got technical prowess. You understand a methodology with edge. You got to get out of your own way and you got to be able to just get innocent, get childlike, get to that place where you're, you feel like you're just a student ob observing and learning and to be able to go and, and do it. That is the end all be all answer to technical mental Come at yeah. me. Yeah, no, we're in complete agreement about that. And I think that this is, and like I said, I'm guilty of this. You look at, you look at FinTwit. I mean, it, depending on where that person is in their career and what they're tweeting about, it, you have to take it within context. I mean, yeah. I talk a lot about psychology because to me, I can look at my charts for five minutes in the morning and know exactly what I'm looking for for the day. I'm not working on that aspect as much. I still am, but not as much. I am trying to be uh, working more on myself and my self-awareness and things like that. I want to talk about Nadro. I mean, we got a ton of questions here today, so I want to make sure I leave enough time for it. And I, cause I want to quickly go to the charts because uh, I know you put some tweets out this morning about S and P and maybe we'll take a look at crude oil, but so I don't want to rush you cause I think Nadro is important, but talk to us about what Nadro is. Nadro is just a, an acronym for the methodology that I have pieced together over a career of, of trading since I started in high school, uh, actually trading, I started studying trading in the sixth grade. Um, so in a DRO, um, it's, it's, it's a top down approach. We start with a big picture and the biggest thing is the in, which is for narrative. You want to, we learn to speak a language of markets. Okay. And it's very, market profile, auction market theory, value, okay? Not like value investing, but value areas from a technical sense. Where is the market telling us there is value? And today, what are we doing relative to where there is established value? 
Okay. So that frames like a context. It's more complicated than that. We use long-term view apps across multiple timeframes. We use uh, custom composite structures with market profile in order to piece together where is their confluence of value across timeframes and learn to speak the language of the market as to what is the market trying to do? Where has there been a most key recent rejection where we've left an area that has been a significant threshold or whatnot? Whether that's a, a trend or whether that's a reversion back into value, that's helping us frame the context. And, and we could even re remind me when we talk about the S&P um, later, I could tell you exactly what was that situation today with why I put that tweet out and whatnot. So anyways, it's all about the narrative. From there, A for acceptance is kind of like telling us where the threshold is crossed, where we understand which narrative, what's going on, where we're biased long or short. And guess what, guys? A lot of people think bias is a very dirty word. Never have a bias, blah, blah, blah. Well, it depends on your definition of bias. If you're blindly biased and, you're, and your answer is to like, why do you want to be long here or whatever, as you could said, because I'm bullish. Well, that sounds like a blind, stupid bias that's going to get you run over if you have the the uh, Anthony's old habit of fading a trend or something. Oh, I'm just, I'm just bearish. This thing's too high, you know? Right. Oh yeah. That's not a, a real bias. Our biases must have a recent key rejection, a likely destination where the market's headed and a line in the sand as to where that bias is invalidated. If you don't have all of that, you don't have an actual healthy bias. So anyways, acceptance tells us which bias to look for. And we learn to not get chopped up as much as markets slightly trade in below, above and below lines in the sand, which is a trader killer. So acceptance is a huge, that's the A in A. D is for developing value, which is shorter term within the context of like where value is big picture. Well, where's value today inside of the big picture? And that helps us access the trade by either fading extremes of today's value or going with what we call imbalance and trend, going with the trend. Context tells us whether we should fight a, a, a short-term trend or what, and that's, you know, that's kind of what I said about crude oil today was I know value migration is lower recently short-term, but I see this as a potential bullish inflection in terms of where the risk reward is skewed. It doesn't mean it's going to go up. It means that this is where I'm seeing risk reward. Um, so we use developing value intraday. Rhythm is something I was taught a long time ago to get in tune with the current level of volatility and the current ebbs and flows. How is the market ebbing and flowing on your trading time frame, so that we can begin to get a little more precise within this contextual framework of narrative, of where we are with the acceptance picture, of where we are with developing value today? Where can we seek to time trades so that we reduce the amount of heat that we take on a position and enhance the risk reward of a position. So that's 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 rhythm. Um, and O is order flow. Order flow is the last man on the totem pole. It's the least important, but it can be the most immediately pressing thing because that is the true hard right edge of the market. What's on the tape? Is there a big flurry of aggressive buyers over the past three seconds? That's important, okay? Maybe it's not time to just slam the bid. Wait for at least that flurry of buying to capitulate and reverse or whatever. Use that to, again, enhance timing, enhance risk reward, see inside the bars, so to speak, right? What's, what's the energy levels behind a bar chart? Well, that's the order flow behind them and how aggressive participants are being. So those are all the tools. It starts at the top. It works all the way down to figure out when and where we have positive expectancy and one of our playbook trades to put on. Yeah, we've had extensive conversations about this in pri prior podcasts. Thank you so much for going back over that again, because it leads us into where we are now. You said that the S&P, you saw that this morning, you put something, you put a tweet out about 4407, I believe. Here's an S&P chart. Do you want a five minute up? Do you want a 30 minute? What do you want up for everybody? Just to um, see. A three minute is, is, I think good. That's kind of okay. what I put our daily market insight charts for. There we go. Three minute chart S&P. Yep. 
Okay. So coming into the pit session open, if you could like just put your cursor there. And then move this. Okay, the pit, uh, the open. Oh, yeah. That's right. With, You're on Eastern. This, yeah, the time is off. Where? Why does it show I that? I believe it's just there. At, it should it be right like here, right? 1300. Yeah, like yeah, that's that. why I'm looking yeah. at it. I'm going, it should be right here, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. So that's the that's the open. Um, kind of at those lows there as we start to just kind of consolidate. Um, so at that point in time, it just goes back to yesterday. Yesterday, I put out a chart and or a video that that narrated kind of my ideas around the market, and it was bullish from the low forty three eighties. And if the market gets above forty four oh six, forty four oh seven area, that is go going to be a place where a lot of new energy comes in. Energy is important. You'll hear me talk about that a lot. It's not just Energy harkens back to an understanding of thinking of markets as participants rather than bars and lines, okay, which some people call market psychology, right? So it's understanding participants and what they're thinking and doing. So yesterday, let me go back and look at uh, what happened yesterday there, right before the close, so right, you know, about half an hour to an hour before the close, we get above and we hold above that 4407. And then we rally right into the close. Right here, I think. We flatline overnight. And then that sell off, we start to hold below it coming into the open. So to me, that was an, a very classic example of something we talk about a lot. What didn't happen? This was a case where what didn't happen, which was buyers coming in and then redefending 4407 from above to take us to fresh all-time highs. That didn't happen. Therefore, 4407, now that we're back underneath it, is a very important inflection. And I, the tweet said, you know, I'm generally bearish because of that failure of that thing to happen. And and sure enough, the high tick of today is what? Like 0850? 08 yeah, 08 yeah. something. 08 quarter. Yep. So just right, right up there. So, you know, I mean, it, this is not a cherry picked example. This is a tweet I put out at the open today. So um, it's just, you know, we, we can see these things a lot, learning the language of NADRO, learning where key inflections are, what the market is doing, what didn't happen, leading us to key recent rejections and likely destinations, like I talked about, to set a bias, which was bearish today below 07. Yeah, I can see that a little bit more here on the 60 minute. I, I get it. So let, let's talk about crude oil now next. Okay. Um, so what do you want me to put up here for crude? I mean, there's almost nothing. I mean, <laughs> let's that... pull up a daily just to start, just to get to get sure. some context so, of where we are. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's this will be good. Let's kind of start high and work lower, and I'll kind of give you some reads. So this general area on a daily is kind of not based on you know horizontal support or resistance or anything, but more based on longer term VWAPs and standard deviations and things like that. This was an area where I thought we could, not that I want to stick my neck out and catch this falling knife, but it's a place where there is kind of some bullishness and potential if we see certain events transpire to say, this is a really nice place to get back on board. What, as you can see, where does this chart run? It runs from the bottom left-hand corner of the chart to the top right-hand corner of the chart. It is a generally bullish chart this year. So this is a pullback within an overall move higher on this time frame. Let's go to like a four hour. So as you can see, there is a bit of a rhythm to this market where starting in the run up to the high of this chart um, from, I can't really see uh, the, the bottom, but it's okay. Um, you mean somewhere uh, the, like right now? Exact middle of the chart kind of just left of one of those bars. Left, 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 stop, boom. So that last leg up into the highs, you see about how long that distance is? 
Yeah. And then right there's here. from. Oh, yep. This one yep. Right yep. Here. Yep. Yep. And so then you see the distance from the high to the next swing low. Got it. So yeah. you're looking at time here now. So like basically. It's so time based, but it doesn't matter. Um, I typically prefer volume based charts. Um, but so exactly. So there's a rotation down and then there's a rotation back up. Doesn't quite get to the highs. Got I'm it. just saying, look at the length of each of those rotations. And then we have quite a long sell off to the, you know, current about, recent yeah, lows. There you go. Lines are perfect. Yeah. Yeah. There, there. and then back there. up. We're looking yeah. at rhythm here. Now, look, there's a, a above average down move all the way down to those new lows. And volatility tends to beget volatility. We get a nice ripper of an up move. And so now we're kind of like in a down move. So I think it's getting a little late in, you know, in the game for pressing shorts here because we're already in quite a, a bit of a down move. We'd want to be bearish from the upper end of that up move. I think essentially intelligently picking tops and bottoms through multiple time frame analysis where you start to get genuine confirmation of the market is turning not picking the precise top or bottom, but saying this is an area where a top or bottom may begin to form and then looking for confirmation on lower time frames. So here we are at the hard right edge thinking this could be a place where the bulls perhaps start to take control. And I said in my tweet today, my, my tweet on crude was a swing time frame perspective. So now let's go to a 30 minute. So zoom in on that, yeah, a little bit to where we can see that high on that chart. Uh, just don't go past that. So you want me to take it like this? It, it, it's perfect the way it is. There you go. Beautiful. Look at this nice little rhythm, right? Down leg, weak retracement. Off, I'm, I'm narrating from the highs. Another down leg, pretty weak, decent retracement. Another sharp down leg, pretty weak retracement. And now here we are in a down leg. Yep. So what's the next logical thing? Some form of a retracement, right? Yeah, exactly. So I'm not going to put a trade on and predict the retracement. I would now need to go to, let's say, the three-minute chart. I don't know why I said three-minute chart, but it's the <laughs> three-minute chart. Okay, so here's where I would actually start to time momentum shifts where you have a market that's kind of going lower, 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 and you start to get a momentum shift. You could use an indicator to help you see this. You could use order flow. You could use um, pure naked price action. You could use all kinds of things to pick points at which there was a down rotation and the momentum starts to turn up. Those are areas on the chart where I'm gonna place trades and place stops beyond, if I'm wrong, that that's the turning point. Now, what? Today is a day where the chart is headed from the top left to the bottom right. And I apologize. I'm not being very NADRO based here. I'm not I'm not talking about a, a lot of NADRO terms because I just think that that might be just beyond the scope of, of, of the talk today. So I'm trying to do it in very generic ways. And really what I've been talking about here is stepping through multiple time frames, understanding the rhythm of those time frames, which is a key component of NADRO. So if we wanted to get long here, I would draw a little line. You see that tiny at the most recent vertical uh, marker. This one right here? Oh, the most um, recent. Yeah, 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 exactly. I would draw a tiny line kind of starting above that a couple one or two bar highs to the right of that line, Anthony. Go right. And you want me to down. draw a, a vertical? Uh, a, or a, a, diag a diagonal line. So you mean like this? Exactly ballparking it right i would yeah. draw it across those highs in my mind i often don't draw those lines like that but just to let folks know at home if this starts to turn up and in fact i'd love to see it run stops below that current swing low actually you basically start to see stuff like that exactly right? you can see it yeah. cross that trend line but you see the way the current low of day is where it tested that level a couple times yeah what would be beautiful is if we ran stops below there and wicked back up we call that a spring pattern. That would be gorgeous. If you can't identify where on the chart stops have recently been run, you have a, a less than ideal opportunity to enter. It's very important. 
thinking of where participants get stopped out. And for us, from a profiling perspective, that's where excess is formed. And if you were to look at market profile today, we have a what's called a poor low at the low of day in crude oil. So I'm not chomping at the bit to buy here. I'd like to see it wick through there. And maybe we'll see that while we're on the on the call here today um, and kind of narrated in, in real time. So to me, based on where we are, based on some longer term VWAPs and getting extended, let's say two standard deviations away from where VWAP is, um, it's a lower extreme, but I'm not going to catch a falling knife. I would look for stabilization, whether it be a spring pattern like we talked about, whether it be something much safer. And it's actually here's happening the stop as we speak. Run. Here's yeah, the stop exactly. run. Absolutely. Now, it doesn't mean that it's going to reverse and go higher from here, guys. Okay. All I'm going to say is that, and you can see it on the tape too. It's not just price going lower here. That was pure bids being hit on the tape. So that is a absolute stop run or the beginning of something, you know, powerful where they're really, you know, let's say it's a news catalyst, but it was powerful. What was I going to say? Mm. Oh, if you wanted to take an even safer play, you wouldn't stick your neck out here just because there was a spring pattern, just because there was a momentum shift. You might actually wait for something more substantial to occur, like a return to value of yesterday's value area, of the current week's developing value. You would look for one of those markets to go what we call rotational and then start to fade some lower extremes. That would be extra confirmation to get into a, a good idea. Does that make sense? No, it does. Totally. I mean, I love the, the thought process. I mean, it's clean. It's simple. It, it puts you, I, I love rhythm because mm -hmm. to me, that's something that you get just from looking at, that's why I didn't put any indicators up today. You could just feel the rhythm of what Cruel is doing. You don't need to be a great technician here. I mean, this is just yep. something to where you look at it and you're going, I would say common sense, right? What has it been doing? And you look at that and you help, that helps you with your execution. I, I think that's just so important. I think too many people look at their charts with too many things on there and they don't look at the raw movement of the market. Yes, yes. And, and that's what I like about this is that it's getting me in my mind, okay, what's actually happening here? Then you can put your layers of your stuff on there. And you talked about market right. profile, other things. And now you're in tune with the market without, before you even go and look at, uh, the indicators. So no, I thought that was great. Um, we've got a ton of questions, Merritt, a ton. So I'm going to try to get through them all, everybody, but I got to tell you, I've probably got over 25. <laughs> so I don't know, just you knowing that Merritt, uh, letting you know that uh, I got to go all the way back to where people were putting them in from the beginning. So we're trying to keep them pretty quick on here so I can get to as many as I can and uh, obviously keep putting them in there because Maybe Merritt and I get to them next time, or maybe we get to them today. Some of them might be very similar questions, but anyway, let's just jump right in. Let me right answer this it. from Jamie here. I'm looking at it. What's the max funded account size? Is that, uh, yeah, let me go back to that. I actually, I'm going to pull that I, up. I just here. wanted to answer that because, because it's toward the bottom here and we might not get to it. Is this it right Guys, here? I obviously have a yeah. limited amount of money, right? I, I, I'm i doing okay and I'm backing traders, but I'm not, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates or what they're not even together anymore, are they? So, <laughs> you know, so there is no max. Okay. If you're on my desk and you are trading well, and let's say we get to the point where you're making $4 million a day and I just simply <laughs> can't give you more size. I'm tapped out. What do you think we're going to do? Let's put our heads together on this. There's going to be people breaking down my door to partner with me. I have people who've said, hey, man, anytime you go into any kind of business or whatever, you let me know, Merritt, I want in. So I have potential partners and we're, there is no max size, okay? This is not a standard template trading desk where there's a scaling program you have to follow and all this crap. 
this is a real prop desk, guys. I just can't explain that enough. I just can't. Anyways, let's go no, back. I, I'm glad you, that you were on the show. That, I'm glad that you answered that first because that's really important. I mean, if people are going to come to you, they have to understand what they're actually coming to. This is not somebody yeah. who created a company that's just, you know, talking about backing traders and collecting revenue from it. Yes. You're backing them. And we talked about the way that you coach them too. I think this is also very important. He knows that no, no two traders are the same. He goes through what needs to be done to help you um, on your path. He, he doesn't implement his stuff uh, into your trading. And I, I, that's just so important. And I, you go back to it, Merritt. I mean, it's because you came from a scenario you learned and they were, uh, you know, you, you, you've been through this. You know yes. what it takes to help these people. So let me get to some of these questions. This is a really yeah. good one too. Gorilla Glue. <laughs> As an aspiring intraday futures trader, is it viable to only average two or three trades per day? Or should I be looking to either watch more markets or find more opportunities in my specialized market? Great question. Yeah. I think if you're specialized in a market, then I think two to three trades a day is, is almost like a sweet spot for a, a, a short-term trader. Let's say that you also look at a three-minute chart or something. I, I think that that is, is beautiful. I think that what's the Steenberger phrase? Let me see if I can remember. He says, yes, first get better, then get bigger, then get broader. That is the that is the pretty apropos for for a developing CPT. Remember, we're always a student. We're always all developing. So it's absolutely viable. Unless you're looking back and saying, oh, there was five or six and I missed half of them, then that's a different topic. But if you're taking what's available and it's two or three a day, that's great. And you're specialized. If mental processing power allows for it or technology allows for it, you can then get broader and you can find that in other markets as long as it's still a viable edge in those markets as well. Great question. Great answer too. Uh, uh, this one's a little bit more about your program. When you are reviewing a recent, this is by AW, when you are reviewing a recently completed trial, what kind of information are you looking to get out of that process and how does that impact your relationship development with said trader? And like I said before, I don't think I can say it any better. I'm looking to get to know that trader, what they're trading, how they're trading it, how they see risk management, uh, what kind of limits I can help them stay within and stay healthy and still trade and, and do what they showed that they did do. Uh, if that makes sense during the, during the tryout. Uh, so it's, I'm looking to walk away from that with a stronger understanding of beginning a relationship with that trader and understanding that trader. And so that we both get off on the right start in terms of let's get down to business. Now let's stay confident. You've been trading, trading well, let's go do more of that. For some, I may see something in the tryout that was a little bit of a red flag or a big green flag, and I'll I'll let them know about those kind of things. Here's what I see just off the cuff here um, as I begin to understand your trading. So that's that's the process. A couple more uh, I'll go through that are about the program. Uh, Christopher Garcia asked, do you pay quarterly? We trade to get profits today or why you pay quarterly? I always yeah. ask. <laughs> we we uh, are partnered with a group and that's how they do it. So we are with um, ARB trading and they pay quarterly. That's just a contractual thing. That's how they do it. Um, and so that's how we do it. Let me let me say this delicately to you, uh, Chris. If you're looking to get a paycheck today from your trading, that could be somewhat of an unhealthy mental perspective from your trading and make things a lot harder than it needs to be. You need to approach trading from a place where you're not trying to pay the electric bill with it. I'm not saying you are, but just generally speaking to everyone here, don't focus on those profits today and trying to get that money in your account today, okay? Think longer term, think growth. So quarterly, in my opinion, shouldn't be a, a, a problem for, for, for most people. What do you, this is by David JD. Uh, what what do you consider a good average R units month for a CPT trader? At what Ten. R multiple? Okay. At what R multiple and a drawdown do you tell a junior trader to stop the bleeding and perhaps go to sim? That uh, so ten is the answer to to the first. I mean, 
you could say five, but but ten for someone who's really starting starting to 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 do well. Um, and the second question, that's going to depend. That's unique. Um, it depends on their psychology. A trader who's really executing well and starts to enter across a, a, a certain threshold of drawdown, I'm not going to tell them, hey, we got to stop the bleeding. We got to pump the brakes, okay? Now, at a, at a certain, like, hugely scary place, it might. But I'm going to look at what are the norms for their cyclical drawdowns. We're always, most of us are in a drawdown most of the time, right? But then we make new equity highs, then we draw down, then we make new equity highs, right? So if a trader, however, is going AWOL outside their process, making bad decisions because I know them and they know them and we know their process, we're going we're gonna to shut them down much quicker, whether that's just for the day and they start to string a couple days together where they're really performing badly over multiple days from a process perspective, not a performance perspective, might be a time to back it off, at least reduce size, not necessarily go to SIM. Going to SIM is, is, can be helpful, but it's more of a last resort. I got to put this out there because I thought this was funny. <laughs> I saw you laugh. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I literally took that system <laughs> deal. <laughs> that was great. I saw it. I just, I'm like, I, I know we're oh, doing yeah, it's actually working. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. That yeah. is hilarious. Um, oh, this is a great question too. By A, uh, what are your thoughts on using micro futures to break up entries given the volatility of the markets? Oh, it's a no-brainer. No-brainer. It's a no-brainer. No the, minute, the minute you think you're too big to trade anything, you're toast. I use micros. I don't need to, but I love them. I haven't used micro crude oil yet. I talked to Merritt about that. Uh, but I do use micros, and I've used it in gold. You, when you and I were down for your golf tournament in 2020, before right, you know, the week that the world changed, um, you and I were talking about just the insanity that was that was in crude oil and, and NASDAQ and things that were going on and whatnot. And I remember you talking about how like things are just so crazy. So when volatility gets crazy, micros are an option, even if you're not normally a micro trader. Exactly. It's, it, it's a way to manage volatility. And it's a way, perhaps, rather than being a one lot S&P trader, Trade 10 micros. It's the same risk, but now you give yourself a little flexibility around scaling out of a position when it when it starts to work. Yeah, 6831 here is a beautiful spot to scale for, for anyone else to <laughs> trade. And then if you want to hold the swing, I think I think that you go for the swing. Oh, we got a really nice confluent spot around 7450. That's the swing. So, uh, Gavin, I'm not ignoring your question, but I think it was already asked. Um, he was talking about really the timeline of the trading. I just want to let people know that I am reading. People can watch question. the recording, right? Yeah, they can go back. It'll be recorded. And let's see here. This is interesting. I don't know. Uh, so Paul is asking for someone who's already using a platform like Thinkorswim, how easy is it is the transition to your platform? It doesn't matter what platform you use. Transitioning Good. to my platform, which is Sierra Chart, is not easy. There is a learning curve. There are a million customizable options, which create a tremendous amount of, of uh, learning and, and, and difficulty to understand it. So what I recommend a lot of people do at the beginning is to continue to maybe do their charting on the platform they're comfortable with. But just simply learn how to execute trades on Sierra Chart and then slowly add pieces and, and, and whatnot from there. Several more of the questions are very similar to about the timeline as to, you know, if they get through the program. I think you answered a lot of those uh, questions. I'm going to get to, like I said, there's so many I'm trying to read. Oh, so here, here's one. Okay. I like this one. Um, Shop Haba. How many times have you found yourself tweaking, fine tuning your strategy, or is it best to leave it untouched, considered it had a track record uh, at times of a losing streak? That's a good one. That is a very good one. So they're all good, by the way. But that, yeah, I like yeah, that if, yeah. if you can imagine 
a 30 trade rolling average of your win percent and your risk reward with each of those on the either the X or the Y axis. So it's an XY plot and you're going to plot, okay, over these 30 trades, I was at two to one risk reward and I was at 50% win percent. And the next time I was, oh, I was at three to one 50% and connect those lines and create a squiggle of rolling 30 trades. You're going to start to see a, a cluster of where your strategy lives in terms of expectancy, including some of the minor drawdowns and when you lose for a handful of days in a row and bring it back or whatever, okay? It's time to look to tweak or look inward or look at what's changed with the market or whatever when you start to live outside that range of normalcy. So I say make it black and white. Look at what's common for you over Ample time, as you said, consider that it does have a track record. Look at that and look at how substantial the streak is in terms of expectancy and how far away you're deviating from what's normal. Jingle Ball asks, by longer term VWAP, you mean weekly and monthly or even higher? Quarterly, yearly is as high as I go. Jeff Davis. I wonder if it's our boy, Jeff Davis. There he is. It is. What's is he up, coming? Buddy? Is he coming uh, this time around to golf? You better be coming this year, Jeff, to the Traders Invitational. This is a good time to say, if you guys are interested in joining Merritt, myself, Pax, Jimmy Jude, uh, Alpha Trends, uh, is Brian Shannon. I mean, we've got Canny. We've got Shy Girl. She's coming this year. We've got so many people already that are coming. If you're interested in joining us at the Traders Invitational, send me an email. Anthony at Crudelli Productions.com. Jeff Davis, if this is the Jeff Davis that we think of and know of, hope or how are you handling the constant divergence between the indexes this year? That's a good question. A wonderful question. It does not affect my life. So how I'm handling it is I don't do intermarket correlation stuff. I I, I don't. So I take the NASDAQ at face value. I take the S&P at face value. Where are we within its context that it's framing as to where its value is and where we are relative to that across multiple time frames? I don't care uh, about uh, uh, you know disparity between different uh, indices and whatnot. For me, every market I look at is independent besides the indices in this one respect. I like to trade the strongest one to the upside um, to me, because I'll trade, I don't really trade the Dow, but I trade the Russell, the S and P and the NASDAQ and whichever one's the most bullish on my strategy is the one yeah. that I try to trade the most. And so that's the only way I really deal with divergences, not at all like I used to, but you know, I, I just know this, you don't want to be selling the strong and buying the weak in an intraday basis. That has never worked for me. I it goes back to me fading moves when like the weak the ones red should should revert. Oh, type. it's gonna go. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah next week today. Uh, oh, you gotta buy them today, and then all of a sudden it rallies two hundred overnight, and I'm flat after I just got you know pounded all day. Um, so, <laughs> oh, this so is good. to be this clear though, there's plenty of people who use intermarket relationships and whatnot. I, I'm just saying that I'm not one of them. That's all. So I'm ignorant. Yeah. This is another one about your um, tryout. How, can you tell us, PD Legend says, can you tell us what percentage of the traders are successful in the tryout? It's, it, I don't know the exact numbers, honest to goodness. I could look them up. I could get that, but it's low. It's like anything else. Um, a lot of people try at this game and not a lot of people succeed. So, I, I mean, I would guess 5 10%. I mean, it's it's low. And he follows up by saying, and do you provide any guidance with an account? Uh, with a live account, you get a heck of a lot of guidance. Like I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, with a tryout, you're, you're, you're on your own. You're just stepping in to say, hey, I'd like to try out to earn a spot on your team to get that guidance. Yeah, I think we covered a lot of that today. Uh, Jose Nestor Suarez, a great topic, in my opinion, to talk about consistency in trading. Think about that. You want me to talk about consistency and trading? <laughs> yeah. How much time do we have? Yeah. Um, all right. I think you and I can answer this. Consistency in one. trading comes, you, you, you don't arrive at that haphazardly. You don't arrive at that by accident. You arrive at consistency in output by consistency in input. Okay. You have to have a process, 
understand it, know it inside and out, and then focus on being consistent in the application of it, being consistent in your risk management, being consistent across the board. Even a lot of people with routines and and everything about their life, um, that's how people arrive at consistency in trading. Probably going to take one more and then we're going to wrap up today. Um, let's see. I, I think PD Legend puts out – I might take two more. Let's make it a good uh, one. Let's go. Well, there, yeah, there's a couple more. I, oh, I lied. I said one more. But this this is a – there's two quick ones I think we can go to. Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> How do I, I – these names, if these, these people come up with, uh, they're great, aren't they? How do I stop making the same mistake over and over? Well – <laughs> you may not want to hear this, but we're going to get down to it here, okay? Nice back, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <We're>... <laughs> These pictures and names are awesome. I love it. Um, <laughs> you, you, you have to use one of the most powerful motivators that humans have. Disgust. You have to get so down bad on yourself. You have to get so disgusted with yourself that you cannot bear to make that mistake. You could go study winning and champions and whatnot, and you would find out that re repeating mistakes is a cancer. Okay. It is the ultimate. So I'm not trying to put you down because trust me, I've been there. But one of the best things that I did to help me get more disgusted was I started to keep a log. I journaled more and I started to keep a specific XYZ errors. For me, it was something I called SAR trading, SAR trading. Stands for stop and reverse. I would get so into trying to be right and trying to figure out what's going on and, and, and whatnot that I would constantly stop and reverse long. Oh, that's not working. Let me get short. Oh, that's not working. Let me get long. Killing me. Absolutely killing me. And guess what? I had a hard time pulling myself out of that and stopping doing that. So in order to get yourself more disgusted, understand exactly what the mistake is, have a name for it, and keep a log of when you do it and how much it costs you. Attach a dollar amount to it and start to track that. That's going to help you get disgusted and stop doing it. I mean, yes. Nice that honesty on that question. Yep. A uh, little break from the questions before I go back to probably the, the final one here. It was Dan O'Brien is asking, what was the winning? I know it says gold, but golf st golf score last year. I don't remember, but I could tell you this. Nobody was beating Warren. I mean, he's a scratch and he played lights out. I think he shot. He was either one. I think he was one over. Yeah. And on tough conditions. Yes. Um, and it's all, it was all, um, it's all handicap based, but this year we're changing it. We're going to be uh, two man teams, and we're going to do a scramble. So we're just going to play. You know, you hit, and then you hit from the next ball, and then you both put in. And we're going to do that because at night we're adding an element to it. We're doing an outdoor barbecue where we're going to have uh, bags, which we call them in Chicago. I know a lot of people call it cornhole, bags. and then we got bocce ball, and we're going to have a bunch of festivities at night. So I don't want golf to be two days and too long. Plus, a lot of people are sending in saying they don't have handicaps. So I just think a scramble is a better format. So you can so pick like your best ball. Will it be best ball or everyone? Well, it's best ball of the of the pair. So it's like there's only one score you're turning in. So you each keep your own score getting and then whoever puts up. No, the best. no, no. We're, we're like, let's just say that you and I are partners, right? I hit a drive. You hit a drive. We go to the best drive. We hit okay. to the green. We go to the best ball there. Best ball. We okay. only ball playing away. one ball in. Okay. Uh, and we do that for speed and just. Everybody will be handicap based, and I talked to my pro about it. And that, to me, I know it's not the true golf tournament of skill. Um, but in order for me to get more people in this that don't play golf that I want to be able to play, I thought this is the best format. Like I said, if if this doesn't work out, I'll change it next year. I'm not held to sure. anything, but you know, so far we're we're uh, close to being full. I'm capping it this year. That's why I call it the Invitational. Oh, it has uh, to be. Yeah. Yeah, I got to cap it. So if you guys are interested, make sure you let me know soon because I got to give uh, everybody the heads up. It's going to be great. Uh, I can't wait. I mean, the amount of people that I've, I've sent in uh, that want to attend, the night's going to be really fun. That's going to be interesting. So um, try to think what was the final question we will end on? Well, there's some actually, I should put out some of the things that people were saying, you know, 
um, you know, wish this was around when I started. They're saying thanks. Um, I think that's pretty much it. You know, when I look at everything here, some of it is a little bit uh, redundant right now. Um, but I think that, look, we, we answered a lot. I mean, Mary, you, you take the time to talk to all of these traders. I can't thank you enough. And appreciate you doing all these uh, these conversations that we've had over the years in the podcast and my other shows. And uh, today Sounds was fun, awesome. Man. It's yeah. always fun. And, and thank you to all the traders out there putting these questions and comments in. I'm loving how everything's going with the live. Uh, yeah, next, I next, prefer it like this, honestly. Me yeah, too. I do. I love it. I'm not changing it. Uh, next week, we have Jim Dalton. Oh, and nice. I'll tune in. The, the, pretty much the godfather the of- godfather. Uh, the Godfather. Jim is such a great guy. I love that guy. He's so great. He's so much fun to talk to. So, I wish sure. I, I want to go fishing with him one day. That's that's uh, that's on my bucket list. Let him have know. You, Let him know. I'm, have you met Jim? Have you spoken with him? Uh, not in person. No. Oh, okay. I was going to say because what I was thinking about doing is because I've had so many people when I put that tweet out say I love to hop in. I might bring a couple of people in and to talk a little bit with him and hear some of those extra conversations. Cool. So maybe you and I will talk about that. Um, but yeah, no, it's uh, next week is Jim Dalton and, uh, stay tuned for my uh, schedule coming up. If you guys enjoyed this show, please give me the thumbs up. If you didn't give me the thumbs down either way, tell me in the comments as to why, uh, you, you, uh, didn't like it. And remember hit that subscribe button. If you're enjoying the show, this will be available on iTunes later tonight. So you could hear Merritt and I's conversation on iTunes, or this will be recorded. So it'll stay here on YouTube. That's a wrap for today, everybody. Merritt, um, real quick, tell everybody the, the website. Um, AbterosTrading.com. AbterosTrading.com. And uh, on Twitter, you're just Merritt Black, right? Yep. Yep. Merritt Black, everybody. Follow him. He's the man. One of the good dudes out there. All right, everybody. See you next week. See you. See you, brother. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five-star review on iTunes. Never miss an episode. Go to anthonycrudelli.com and get on our email list for show notifications and for free content that is exclusively for subscribers. Also on anthonycrudelli.com, you will find tons of videos and education on trading futures, options, and crypto. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Opinions expressed are solely my own and my guests, and they do not express the views or opinions of my sponsors. Future's radio show is produced by Crudelli Productions.